love this podcast, and you're better for True Cat Army. <laughs> That's awesome. And that cute. <laughs> Military Murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of those. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning. This episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is a true crime podcast that focuses on murders committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. All right, I just want to give a shout out to this week's two producers. Producer Crystal Lynn is a first. And Crystal Lynn is a crafty crochet chick who enjoys making crafts. She makes crafts like the F-bomb, which is a hilarious crocheted bomb with a giant F on it. And she also makes these filthy rags. And they're crocheted rags that literally say F this and F that. I think it's hilarious. Um, And I am just so thankful that Crystal Lynn was kind enough to donate to the Military Murder Morale Fund this week. And I am beyond blessed. Thank you so much, girl. My second producer for this show is Amanda W., And I just want to say thank you so much, Amanda, for donating to the Morale Fund. For my producers for this episode and my producers from the the past and my producers for the future, I'm just so thankful. And it really, it really, it just fills my heart and I'm so thankful. All right. This is the episode that you have all been waiting for. Part three and the finale of the saga on BTK. If this is the first episode that you're listening to, or if you haven't listened to episodes 21 and 22, which is part one and part two, you may want to stop and go back and listen to those before you listen to this one, okay? Now, without any further interruption, let's finish digging. My sources for this episode are the same as those listed in part one and part two. But I want to reiterate that my number one resource for this entire story was John Douglas's book called Inside the Mind of BTK. At the conclusion of part two, I left off on August 15th, 1979, when Paula was running around her house, running errands or whatever, and she recognized BTK's voice. And then she told her husband that it sounded just like him. What? That was all that happened. That was literally all that happened. She told him it sounded like him. And then she just went about her day and didn't say anything. She didn't nudge him on it. She never called the police. She never asked someone else like, hey, does this sound like my husband? She just dropped the subject. Now, interestingly, this wasn't the first time that Paula had connected Dennis to something that BTK did. Do you remember that poem that Dennis wrote about Shirley Vianne called Shirley Locks? Well, When he was in the middle of drafting the poem about death and murder, he left the poem on his chair in the living room. Okay, what the heck? Why would you be a murderer in general? And then why would you write a poem about death and murder and then leave it on your freaking couch where your wife could find it? So guess what? Paula found the poem and she confronted him about it. He got really nervous and told her, oh, you know, honey, this is just a project for my criminal justice class. And it's actually a criminal justice project on BTK. And Paula was shook, but she soon moved on. (sighs) I think this is, isn't that so, so scary? On these two occasions, the first time when she found this Shirley Locks poem, and the second time when she recognized his voice as BTK's voice, Dennis thought for sure that he was busted. I mean, he murdered seven people by that point, and he thought, well, it's a wrap. But it wasn't. It wasn't long, though, before Paula caught Dennis red handed during one of his bondage parties again. It was 1980 and she was pissed. Dennis knew that he screwed up and he begged for forgiveness. Please, please, please. I'm so sorry. But you know what? If you want me to leave, I'll leave. But Paula gave him another stern warning. This crap stops now. And this was when Dennis got creative. He stopped the bondage parties at home. He didn't want to risk getting busted again. And then he turned to motel parties and motel parties are exactly what they sound like. He'd go away on business and he'd take all his bondage stuff and he'd have his bondage parties in a hotel room. And for a couple of years, Dennis went underground again. Maybe he was too busy with work and fatherhood. 
In 1984, 10 years after the Otero family murders, Wichita was still no closer to finding the infamous BTK. So the police department created an eight-person task force to find him. They were called the Ghostbusters. And John Douglas described that the Ghostbusters were made up of a captain, a lieutenant, and six drug investigators. They were only together for about three years. And in 87, after not getting any closer to finding the ghost, the Ghostbusters were disbanded. It wouldn't be long before BTK began to have the itch. And actually, it was in the middle of when the Ghostbusters were trying to find him that he struck again. It was 1985, and Dennis was walking in his neighborhood. Maybe he was walking a dog or playing with kids. I don't, I, it doesn't actually say. He was just walking. And he saw one of his older neighbors. It was 53-year-old Maureen Hedge. Maureen had a green thumb, and she was always outside gardening. And Dennis was walking, and he waved at Maureen and said hello. You know, just, you know, some friendly chit-chat with neighbors. And just then, Dennis imagined Maureen with a noose around her neck. And that was it. Maureen was on borrowed time. Dennis named her Project Cookie because she worked at a coffee shop. At this point, Dennis was driving into unknown territory. He had never killed a neighbor. He never had any connection to any of his victims. So he realized he might be getting too close for comfort. And that was when he came up with an elaborate plan. First, he had to stalk her to find out what her routine was. So late at night, after his family was asleep, he would sneak out and he would lurk through Maureen's window. On one of his prowling missions, Maureen's cat saw him from inside the window and started hissing at him. But cats didn't scare Dennis. By this point, Dennis's son was a Boy Scout and Dennis was a Boy Scout leader. And in late April, they were planning a camping trip. And Dennis realized the camping weekend would provide the perfect cover up for this murder because she would be murdered close to his house, but he was going to be out of town. It was Saturday, April 27th, 1985. And Dennis took Brian on the camping trip with the Boy Scouts. And they spent the day setting up camp, getting everyone all set. And then night fell and Dennis began to complain of not feeling well. So he called it an early night and said, goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, troops. As he returned to his tent. Later, he snuck out of his tent, grabbed his hit kit that he had already hidden nearby and walked to a nearby bar. At the bar, he ordered a beer. He took a sip and then he spilled the rest of it on him and like splashed it on his face to look like he was drunk. And then he stumbled outside the bar and hailed a cab. He told the cabbie that he needed to be taken close to his neighborhood, whatever it was. He said, take me here. But before the cab could get too close, he said, pull over, pull over. I don't feel too well, pretending that he had to throw up. So, of course, the cab driver pulls over. And then Dennis, he got out of the car pretending to be sick and says, you know what? Just just leave. I'm close enough. I can just walk and I need to walk this off anyway. Now, listen, this murder really took a lot of planning. Remember how Dennis's in-laws lived near him? Well, on this particular night, in order to get to Maureen's house, he actually cut through his in-laws' backyard. Then he pried open Maureen's window and got in. He was surprised to find that her bed was empty because she was usually home in bed by then. So, of course, what did Dennis do? He decided to wait. Maureen, that particular night, she had been out playing bingo. She got home around 11 p.m., but she wasn't alone. She was with a man. And Raider quickly heard the man's voice and he hid in the closet. Not again. The man stayed for a little bit with Maureen before saying goodbye and then she got ready for bed. Raider waited until Maureen was asleep in bed when he emerged from her closet. She was asleep and then he jumped on her and grabbed her by the throat. Maureen didn't even know what hit her. She was so fragile because remember, she was, a, she was a little bit older. She was so fragile that she passed out from him grabbing her by the throat, which made Raider mad. He was mad that she died so quickly, but he tied her up anyway and he put a garrote around her neck. By this point, she was dead. He then wrapped her up in a rug and did something unprecedented, at least for BTK. He put her body in the trunk of her car and then he drove her to the Christ Lutheran Church. That was the church that he attended on Sundays. And remember, his wife and his mother-in-law, they were in the choir. Well, because Dennis used to help around the church, he actually had a key to the church and he had already planned to bring her there. So earlier that week, he went to the basement of the church when no one was there 
and he blacked out the, the basement window so that when he was there and the light was on, no one would be able to see the light outside. On this night, he carried Maureen into the basement and then for hours he took pictures of the deceased woman in different provocative positions. He then stripped her naked and dumped her body in a ditch a few miles away. He then covered her up with sticks and leaves, dumped her car in the mall parking lot, and then he returned to the campsite. And it was as if nothing happened. The next morning, he woke up and he was making breakfast for the Boy Scouts. When it comes to vitamins, we all deserve to be a little bit of a skeptic. And if you are, that's a good thing, especially when it comes to vitamins, which is why I choose to take the Ritual Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Ritual created a clinically backed multivitamin for women who are 18 and over. Ritual's multivitamin supports brain health, bone health, blood health, and provides antioxidant support. And above all else, Ritual has traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. I've always, or almost always, been a vitamin consumer, but I never liked the taste, chalky and honestly just nasty. I often wondered what all those ingredients even meant on the label, but I figured, hey, I needed the vitamins, so I just put up with the horrid taste and the ingredients I couldn't even pronounce. But that is now an issue of the past, ever since I found Ritual. Because Ritual comes packed with nine key nutrients in two capsules per day. So you can take your vitamins and relax knowing that you are in good hands. Another thing is that Ritual is packaged in a minty capsule that will leave you feeling refreshed. I've been using Ritual Essential for Women for two months now, and I couldn't be happier. So listen up, no more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. And right now, Ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash military10 to start Ritual or to add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. When Maureen was discovered and the police did a canvas of the neighborhood, Dennis had the perfect alibi. He was camping with the Boy Scouts. And really, the man, remember that man that Maureen was with for bingo after bingo, or whatever? He really looked suspicious because he was the last one to see her alive. And BTK wasn't even a suspect in this killing because BTK wasn't known for taking his victims out of the homes. And remember, this is in 1985 and the Ghostbusters task force had been you know, put put into place in 84. So they were alive and kicking in 85 when he committed this murder. Well, a year and a half later, Dennis struck again. And you see how the spacing of the all these attacks really makes you wonder, how can a killer go underground for so long? In early September 1986, Dennis was parked in his car having lunch when he spotted her, his next victim. It was 28-year-old Vicki Weggerly. She was married and she had two kids. She had a 10-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. And Dennis crafted the perfect plan. He pretended to be a repairman and he even made a fake repairman name tag thingy. It was late morning on September 16, 1986, and he walked up to Vicky's neighbor's house to practice his story. So uh, he could have just walked up straight to Vicky's house, but he was like, okay, let me test this out. I'm, te- I'm trying something new today. Let's try something else. So he knocked on an elderly woman's door and she answered. And Dennis said, hey, I'm here to check your phone line. And then the elderly woman was like, okay, cool, come on in. And for a quick second, Dennis was like, well, I could just kill this lady. But he thought, nah, it's okay. And he told the lady, no, it's okay. I can just go out back and check out back. So he did his thing in the back, pretending that he was actually a repairman. And then he walked to the next house and it was Vicky's house. He knocked and Vicky answered, and he told her the same story. I'm a repairman, and I was sent here to check her phone line. And Vicky looked at him. She was real skeptical, but, you know, she let him in. Vicky's husband was at work that day, and her daughter was at school. The only other person at the house was her two-year-old son. Once inside, Dennis brandished his gun, and he told her that he just wanted to take pictures of her, but she refused. She was like, Mm-mm, I am not taking these clothes off. And that really made Dennis angry because usually his victims were so compliant and he was mad that Vicky wasn't. So then he decided to strangle Vicky and Vicky fought back like a tiger and she scratched at Dennis's neck, capturing his DNA. Then he continued to strangle her until she was dead and he took the pictures that he wanted. He then stole her driver's license and stole her car before dumping it in the mall parking lot. 
Now, Vicky was dead, but her young son was not hurt. Sadly, Vicky's husband would live an eternity under scrutiny because everyone thought hashtag the husband did it. And once again, no one connected BTK to this murder and the case grew cold. The following year, Dennis was still working with ADT and sometimes he would go away on business trips with ADT. And in Douglas's book, he reports that while Dennis went away, he was actually still breaking into people's houses and stealing their underwear. And during one of these business trips, he spotted his next project. It was mid-1987 while in Belleville, Kansas. Now, Dennis was driving around being a creeper, which is, you know, his thing, when he saw a woman inside her house playing with her kids. So he's driving by probably very slowly when he sees a mom and her kids in the inside of her house and she's playing with her kids. Dennis got excited. He quickly made up his mind. Cool. I'm doing it. I'm doing it now. So he parked a few blocks away and then he walked to the house. But when he got to the house, the family was gone and he no longer saw the woman inside and he didn't see her car either. But Dennis thought, you know, this hasn't stopped me before. I'll just go inside and wait. So he broke in and then he waited for two hours. But thankfully, the mother and the kids never returned. And so then he just left. A year later, in July of 88, Dennis lost his job with ADT. But in 89, he snagged a new job as a field supervisor for the U.S. Census Bureau. Within a year, he became state supervisor. So he was on cloud nine. He loved being in charge of people. It was at this point that Dennis got even bolder. He found his next project, a woman who lived in Hayes, Kansas. He called her Project Prairie. But before he went for her, he dug her a grave. Crazy, right? This guy is just so creepy. He broke into her house and he was surprised that she wasn't home. So he waited and waited and waited. And again, thankfully, this woman never came home. So he took her purse and he just left. Again, this woman was just so freaking lucky. In September of 1990, he decided to bring his bondage sessions into the workplace. So remember, at first he was having these bondage sessions at home, then he got busted twice, and then he was having these bondage sessions in motel rooms, and that was fine. But in September of 1990, he had his own office, so he was like, you know what? Let's do these bondage sessions at work. He was the state supervisor, and so he was like, okay, what the heck, why not? So one day, he hung up his uh, out-to-lunch sign, and then he closed the door in his office. And for an entire hour, he stripped and participated in the auto-erotic behavior that he loved. He dressed up and then also he did the whole bondage thing. But you know what? He was more thrilled by the fact that he was doing this at work than anything else. That was the thrill of it is not being caught. Around October 1990, he picked out his next project, Project Dogside. She was a 62-year-old retired secretary named Dolores Davis, and she lived near a dog shelter, hence Project Dogside. After watching her for months, he decided to finally do it. On January 19th, 1991, after a Boy Scout event, he changed at the church and then he parked a mile or so from the house where Dolores lived and then he walked 25 minutes. Dolores was home, he could see. So instead of breaking in while she was still awake, he waited until she went to bed. And once she was asleep, he launched a cinder block through her glass back door. Now, this made clearly a loud sound. And of course, Dolores came running to the sound and then he told her the same story that he told the Oteros and Kathy Bright. I'm an ex-con, escaped from prison, blah, blah, blah. And then he put handcuffs on her. He then made her lay on the bed and she pleaded, please, please, I have kids. Sadly, Dolores was expecting the birth of her first grandchild. But Dennis didn't care and he strangled her anyway. He then wrapped her in a rug and put her in the trunk of her own car. He threw her body in a ditch and then he returned her car to the garage. And then he did the weirdest thing. It's not really that weird because it's Dennis Rader, but he did something that was not Dennis Rader like. He got back into his car. He went back to where he he had dropped Dolores off. He put the body in his car. Then he drove further out, dumped her body again. But before he left, he decided to have a photo shoot with the corpse. Now, Dolores was found two weeks later by a boy walking his dog. 
and near her body was one of those really weird, creepy looking porcelain masks I told you about earlier in the story. Again, the investigation didn't reveal much and BTK wasn't even a suspect. According to John Douglas, after Dennis killed Dolores, he started writing about his projects down in his diary like a schoolgirl scribbling about their crush. He had Project Nails, a woman who lived in business suits, Project Two Black, which was two black co-eds who lived a block away from the same nail salon where his wife worked. And then he had Project Mex, a Mexican family. He also had Project Twin Peaks. And this was an elderly couple that lived in a neighborhood called Twin Peaks. And for this project, he was actually ready and he took steps. He parked far from the house and he began making his way to the couple's house. This time, though, he was changing it up a bit and he brought a shotgun because he wanted to know what it was like to kill someone with a shotgun. So he was beep bopping along the road with his shotgun like an idiot. And it was dark outside. And Dennis was so into himself that he didn't realize that there was a cop driving on the road with its lights off presumably following someone. Was it him? So Dennis freaked out and then he dove into a bush, but the cop wasn't after him at all and the cop just kept on driving. Now that, that right there really freaked Dennis out and he was pissed because he scratched his shotgun. So he walked back to his car and drove home and Project Twin Peaks was canceled, thankfully. By May of 91, Dennis started a new job as a compliance supervisor for Park City. If now, what is, what is this anyway? Imagine the worst HOA, the, the worst HOA, and that's what Dennis Rader was. He had a little ruler sometimes and he was measuring grass. He was yelling at folks when they didn't put their trash cans back in time. He was ticketing folks who didn't have their dogs on a leash, that type of stuff. Well, after Dennis's 10th kill, he dreamt of killing again, but he seemed to have gotten just caught up with life and he stopped taunting the police by this point. Towards the end of the 90s, Paula and Dennis became empty nesters. The kids were out of the house and he needed hobbies to preoccupy him. But instead of turning to more murder, Dennis got really into church and he would visit Kansas State to attend college football games with his daughter. And isn't that, isn't that crazy? If you were tailgating at K-State in the late 90s, you could have actually been having jello shots with BTK, and that's crazy. So let's fast forward to January of 2004. By this point, the Raider kids are off living their lives. Dennis's son has joined the Navy now, and his daughter has gotten married. And it was Sunday afternoon, and Dennis had just returned home from church. He sat in his favorite chair, put up his feet, and he opened up the newspaper. Imagine the shaking of newspaper, right? And what do you know? When he opened up the Wichita Eagle, there was an article marking the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders. The headline read, quote, BTK case unsolved 30 years later, end quote. The article focused on a local lawyer and criminal justice professor named Robert Beatty. Beatty commented that he was shocked that the city of Wichita, they practically forgot about BTK because some of his criminal justice students, they had no idea who BTK was. And BD plans on writing a book about BTK. And that right there, that really upset Dennis Rader. And Dennis got bold. After decades of going underground, he decided to open communications again. And on March 24th, 2004, the Wichita Eagle received a letter with a photocopy of Vicki Weggerly's driver's license and pictures of her body that not even police had. Vicky was the woman with the two-year-old. Remember, Dennis was pretending to be the repairman. Well, the letter that he sent with Vicky Weggerly's driver's license and a picture of her body, he signed it BTK. Now, everyone was shocked. What in the world? Everyone presumed that BTK was dead or that at least he was serving time in jail for a different crime. But no, no, no. He was a free man. <laughs> About a week after the BTK letter came in, the police held their first conference regarding BTK. Quote, the Wichita Police Department recently received information on the Vicki Weggerly homicide that occurred on September 16th, 1986 in the 2400 block of West 13th Street. Mrs. Weggerly was discovered in her home shortly before noon on that day by her husband. Her murder remains unsolved. Investigations personnel now believe 
that this homicide could possibly be linked to the unsolved homicides that occurred in Wichita in the 1970s and were attributed to the BTK serial killer, end quote. After the press conference, nearly 1,000 tips came in, and the police decided to go out and take voluntary swabs from local men in their late 40s and 50s, and they got nearly 1,600 swabs and none were a match for any of the DNA left behind at the BTK murders. Now, you have to remember, DNA was up and coming in 2004. And now that BTK was taking credit for Vicky's murder, remember she was like a tiger? Well, they had scraped the DNA from her fingernails and they matched the DNA to the DNA found at the Nancy Fox's murder scene. So the police knew this was the real killer. They had DNA but they had no match with everybody that they had taken the swabs for and there was no one in their system. Well, police and detectives kept digging and on March, 2004, another BTK package arrived. This arrived at the Cake TV studio and it was the table of contents of a book of sorts. And the title of the book, The BTK Story. After that, BTK communicated again. This time he left a Ziploc bag taped to a stop sign and outside it said BTK Fieldgram. The letter contained his account of the Otero murders, focusing mostly on little Josephine, and he included a drawing of a woman gagged and with a noose around her neck. It said, quote, the sexual thrill is my bill, end quote. In October of 2004, BTK sent yet another Fieldgram. In this set of letters, he disclosed that he worked in threes because the number three was based on the eternal triangle. And it included this little package included three index cards, kind of his biography, which contained half truths. Well, a few months after that, on January 25th, 2005, BTK sent another postcard to Cake TV. This postcard led police to a package which was tied to a street sign. The package was a cereal box for serial killer because he's such a turd. And inside, they found some jewelry and a doll with a tiny noose around its neck. And the doll was tied to a pipe, similar to what he had done to little Josephine. And this guy is just so sick. By this point, Dennis felt like his life had meaning again. I mean, dang, that's a lot of packages, Dennis. You really are an empty nester. Get a life. In his latest package to police, BTK asked if they had found the package that he left in the Home Depot parking lot. So police went crazy trying to find out what the heck package he was talking about. And then they found surveillance video of a grainy figure getting out of what appeared to be a Jeep Grand Cherokee and chucking something into the bed of someone's truck. Eventually, police tracked down the truck owner and he turned over an odd cereal box, the odd cereal box that had been left in his trunk while he was shopping in Home Depot. The box contained a letter that said that the killer's lair was booby trapped with explosives and it included a list of projects. Quote, Project Little Mex, my one big hit, a good start as a serial killer. Project Foxtail, Nancy J. Fox, my best hit, end quote. And the letter ended with, quote, look, be honest. If I send you a disc, will it be traceable? Just put the answer in the newspaper under miscellaneous section 494 and put Rex, it will be okay. Run it for a few days in case I'm out of town, etc. And I will try a floppy for a test run sometime in the near future, February or March, end quote. On January 28th, a detective ran the ad in the Wichita Eagle, quote, Rex, it will be okay, end quote. It was around this time that Paula noticed how similar Dennis's handwriting was to BTK. Dennis was writing a letter to his younger brother who was deployed with the military at the time. And Paula commented, quote, you know, you spell just like BTK, end quote. And I'm assuming that she said this after watching news reports of the newly invigorated investigation into the Kansas serial killer BTK. But again, Paula went about her day and she didn't report anything. It was early 2005 and Dennis had just been chosen to be the Christ Lutheran Church president. At that point, the leaders of the church had organized a tour of the local TV studio, Cake TV. And now Dennis was the president of the church. So he had the nerve to go and take a tour of Cake TV, 
Now, remember, KTV, this was the leading news station covering the return of BTK. And unbeknownst to everyone, in walked BTK into the studio with his church group, Insanity. They had no idea that BTK was right there, right there with them. And I learned about that in the Oxygen special called uh, Snap Notorious BTK. So go check that out. It was soon after his visit to Cake TV that Dennis typed up some notes on his church computer and then he put it on a floppy disk. The floppy contained a note to the police and it said, quote, this is a test. See three by five card for details on communication with me in the newspaper, end quote. Then he put the floppy disk in a padded envelope and mailed it off. On February 16th, 2005, Cake TV received a package. It was a floppy disk. The detectives received the floppy disk and soon got their computer guy on it. Detective Randy Stone was in charge. Click here, click there, click here. And right in front of them appeared the name of the man they had spent the better part of their lives looking to nail. Dennis. The owner of the computer that it was written on was Christ Lutheran Church. What in the world? Was this a joke? Could it have actually been this easy? Well, a quick Google search put a face to the name. Christ Lutheran Church was located in Park City, Kansas. Oh, look, they have a church directory. The church president, a man by the name of Dennis Rader. Now, it was the police that was filled with that weird excitement in their belly. But it wasn't that simple. The detectives, they needed to be 100, no, 1,000, no, 1 million percent sure that this was their guy. So the cops got to digging. They drove by Dennis's home and boom, a Jeep Cherokee, just like the one in the surveillance video with the cereal box. Except that car wasn't Dennis's car. It was his son, but his son was away with the Navy. The police began to tail Dennis, but not making anything obvious. They had detectives check on him at night to make sure that he wasn't off serial killing. They needed a way to get Dennis's DNA to test it against all of the DNA that he left at the crime scene. Well, one savvy detective was like, "Okay, this is a small town. We can't go around trying to, you know, steal his trash or anything like that. But they were like, "Okay, his daughter went to K-State and she must have visited the medical center at some point when she was there. So by this point, Carrie, Dennis's daughter, she had graduated, but the facility still had her medical record. And the cops got a court order. And in the medical record, they found one piece of DNA. One of Carrie's old pap smears. Say what now? Yes, you heard me correctly. Can you believe this story? For my true crime army that already knew about BTK, I knew about this case. And I had heard it in multiple occasions, on multiple TV shows, on multiple documentaries. And then I read the book. But I always thought, that, their, that his DNA was caught because of somebody's blood sample or a saliva test that confirmed, you know, Dennis's identity. But no, it was a pap smear. What in the world? And this may be ignorant, but never in one million years would I have imagined that a pap smear, that my pap smear could lead to the capture of a criminal family member. I mean, it's crazy. Anyway, the results of the pap smear DNA showed that Carrie was related to BTK. Remember all that semen that Dennis was leaving at scenes? Remember ferocious Vicky Weggerly scratching Dennis's neck? Well, all that DNA was a familiar match to Carrie. And I can just feel the weird excitement swell in the investigators' souls. They finally had their guy. John Douglas explained that on this same day that detectives discovered the true identity of BTK, BTK was still off terrorizing Kansas. A woman by the name of Kimmy Comer, she said that she had gotten home that day and left the door open because it was a beautiful day. She was in her house doing her thing when she turned and Dennis was standing in her living room just staring at her. Uh, He didn't budge when she turned and saw him. He said, quote, oh, I just wanted to make sure that you didn't forget your court date for the ticket I gave you, end quote. Kimmy was mortified. What in the hell was he doing in her living room? And how was he so stealthy? Basically, for the last eight months, Dennis had been hounding this woman for having two cars parked in her driveway and he had given her a ticket and she had a court date. Well, Dennis was just making sure that she was going to show up. 
Well, Kimmy got right up in Dennis's face like Snooky from the Jersey Shore, and she was cursing him out for coming into her house without her permission. But Dennis didn't get angry. He just turned around and walked away. Now, Kimmy wasn't done with him just yet. She called him an old pervert and she called him a goddamn dog catcher. As I was reading this portion of John Douglas's book, I couldn't resist the laughter. You go, girl, Kimmy. But Kimmy got really lucky, especially coming this close to Dennis Rader slash BTK. She was a single mother. She had explained that for the last eight months, as I stated earlier, Dennis was nonstop hounding her. He was measuring her grass. He was coming by her work. I mean, he would park in front of her house. And then when he saw her, he'd drive off. And then once he actually gave her two kids a ride home and she was livid. And on many occasions, she would actually would describe coming home and finding that some of her pictures were missing and sometimes even her underwear. One time she got a call from a neighbor that Dennis was looking for her. So she raced home from work. And when she got to her house, her window was open and Dennis poked his head in her window while she was inside. But again, Kimmy wasn't having it. And so she yelled, you up. And then she dialed 911. But once again, the police arrived and they said, hey, Mr. Raider, he's just doing his job. Do you ever get sick of how many times you're scrambling to figure out dinner plans? I mean, dinner is every night. How can someone be so unprepared for a daily task? I'm super guilty of this sometimes. Well, fret no more, because with HelloFresh, you never have to worry about what's for dinner, because HelloFresh will deliver farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes directly to your doorstep. March is National Nutrition Month, and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious, dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals under 700 calories and with only one-third the sodium in other meals. This month, the dietitian win menu includes pecan crusted chicken, one pan spiced turkey lettuce wrap, creamy Dijon dill chicken, and Southwest stuffed green peppers. I recently tried the Southwest stuffed green peppers and they are delicious. And while this meal appeals hardcore and hard to make, the recipe was super easy to follow. It took roughly 30 minutes to make the entire meal, so I call that a win. HelloFresh is truly life-changing. No more worrying about mealtime. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60. That's MilitaryMama and the number 60. And use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Visit HelloFresh.com slash MilitaryMama60 and use my code MilitaryMama60 for 60% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Well, on February 25th, 2005, 31 years after Dennis started his reign of terror over the citizens of Wichita, Kansas, the jig was up. Dennis left his office for lunch at 1215. And within a minute of his drive home, he was pulled over. And the detectives, they weren't taking any chances. They brought a posse. They had helicopters and a ton of unmarked cars. Raider jumped out of the car quickly and the detectives ran up to him and they threw his stupid face to the ground. Dennis was as cold as ice. As he was hoisted up from the ground, he said, quote, tell my wife I won't be home for lunch. I assume you know where I live, end quote. At first, Dennis wasn't in the mood to talk, but he was eager to know what the cops had on him. And then his heart sank when he discovered the floppy disk did him in. He asked, quote, why did you lie to me, end quote. And the detective responded, because I was trying to catch you. Dennis said, quote, a little 30 piece of plastic floppy was my demise. That's what cooked my goose, end quote. The cop then looked at him and said, quote, say who you are, end quote. To which Dennis replied, BTK. And that was a wrap. They had their guy. For 32 hours, BTK confessed to the 10 murders. Of the fact that he never raped any of his victims, he said that he didn't want to, quote, cheat on his wife, end quote. Ugh. Dennis then went on to tell the cops they should be happy that they caught him when he did because he was planning his next kill. He had his target picked out and everything. According to the Oxygen documentary on BTK, one of his co-workers, Mary Capps, she said that she believed that she was his next intended victim. 
because he was her supervisor and for months she had been lodging complaints against him. But because he had been there for many years, the company did nothing. The mission to catch BTK was a multi-city endeavor though, because at the time that they were arresting Dennis, simultaneously police were at his wife's house, at his in-law's house, and at his brother's homes. They had everyone ready for questioning because they wanted to question them all at the same time. They didn't want to have any type of bleeding from one testimony or one confession or one statement to the next. Dennis's in-laws said, no way, you have the wrong guy. And Paula, Paula, the one who had caught her husband on so many times, she denied that her husband was capable of such gruesome murders. And she did this for four hours until there was a moment of realization, a moment of clarity, a quote, coincidence. She said, quote, you know, Dennis used to drive me to work in 1974 and we'd always go past the Otero house. That was the route he'd always take. But you've got the wrong guy, end quote. Come on, Paula. The identical voice, the identical handwriting, the bondage parties, the murder poem. Girl, you're in denial. Dennis's son was also in disbelief. Quote, we had the leave it to beaver life. Mom was always at home and dad was doing everything. The scouts, church, helping out at school. Every summer we'd go on summer vacations. It just doesn't make any sense. The only thing that ever gave me any cause of suspicion happened when I was a little boy and I was going through dad's stuff. I found this drawing. It was a woman in this horrible position. She was all bound up in ropes. It scared me and I put it away and never looked in his stuff again, end quote. On June 27th, 2005, Dennis pled guilty to 10 counts of first degree murder. And on August 18th, 2005, he was sentenced to 10 life sentences in El Dorado Correctional Facility. And you're probably wondering, why didn't he get the death penalty? Well, actually, during the commission of his offenses, Kansas had abolished the death penalty, so he wasn't eligible for the death penalty. Although, my goodness, he most definitely was an excellent candidate, at least in my personal opinion. Dennis's entire statement to the court is available online and it's linked directly on my website so you can go there. And guys, this video, it actually was the last thing that I watched after I read the book by John Douglas and after I watched the Oxygen special. And when I say that I just about lost my crap when I listened to this coward talk so callously about murder, I mean it. He described putting down an entire family, putting down as if they were animals. Boy, oh boy, I hope that this man gets what he has coming because it's just horrific. The real hero in this story is a police officer by the name of Ken Landveer. He was one of the original Ghostbusters in the task force in 1984. But even after the force was disbanded in 87, he made it his life's mission to never stop looking for BTK. And John Douglas, the FBI profiler, he says that he actually coached Ken on how to gain the suspect's trust. And that's exactly what Ken did. Through all those communications, through all those press conferences, he built a rapport that ultimately led to Dennis's downfall. As I was reading John Douglas's book, I scoured and I was, you know, trying to understand why as a society are we so obsessed with this true crime culture? I, I mean, I want to believe that I'm not, that I'm not crazy, you know? And I found Douglas's words on this topic on point. He said that we, quote, consume these books and magazines in order to understand a violent offender's background, to grasp what makes him so different than the rest of us, particularly when they seem to so closely resemble us, end quote. Now, John Douglas, he got two and a half hours to interview Dennis in jail after the trial. And Dennis said that he tried to not think about his evil thoughts anymore. Now he spent his days drawing smiley faces and reading the Bible. And he talked a lot about God and forgiveness and whether he'd be allowed into heaven. And John Douglas doesn't, he doesn't, you know, he's like, whatever, this is bull. I don't believe this God talk. John Douglas says that in a 10 year study on serial killers, their research has revealed that if serial killers could choose a profession, that it would be a minister, a cop, or a counselor. That is so scary, guys. 
Douglas writes books about serial killers because he wants people to understand that Raider and other killers, they don't happen overnight. It's not like this little light bulb, like, oh, I'm gonna go be a killer. BTK started as a kid, and Douglas believes that parents and teachers are the first line of defense and that they should be able to recognize certain behavioral red flags. And I'd like to paraphrase here what he says. Basically, take off your blinders. Really, taking off your blinders could save lives. And ultimately, by talking about the habits of killers, true crime enthusiasts just like us, like me and you, True Crime Army, by talking about this, we can avoid becoming victims ourselves. I never, never like to end my episodes talking about the killer. But I think that there is a good lesson in the list that I'm about to share. It's the top eight things that people can do on a daily basis to protect themselves from becoming victims. And this list was curated by Dennis Lynn himself. It's his very own how to avoid being murdered list. You ready for this? Take notes. Number one, get a security system. Number two, if you're a woman who lives alone, pretend that you live with a man. So basically this means lay some men's clothes around, leave a man's toiletry kit in your bathroom, that type of stuff. Number three, get two dogs, one for outside and one for inside. Number four, on your answering machine or your voicemail, let a man record your outgoing message so it sounds like someone lives with you. Number five, always check your phone for a ringtone. But, you know, this is kind of moot. But, you know, Mama Margot would suggest always have a charged phone. That's what I would suggest. And actually, maybe have a maybe having an actual phone line, like a, like a hard line in your house would be a good thing. I don't know. Maybe. Number six, always leave a radio on at home. Number seven, avoid routines. They make you vulnerable. And number eight, women should always be aware of who is constantly parked outside their home. Yikes. Ladies and gents, that's the list. Stay safe out there and take care of each other. All right, that's a wrap. That's a wrap on BTK. He's in jail where he deserves to be. Hopefully forever. I personally think that um, Dennis Rader is the scariest serial killer that I know of. And I say this because, I mean, he was a church president, for goodness sake. You never expect your church president, who's an empty nester and an Air Force veteran, to be a serial killer. And that right there makes it the scariest serial killer for me. But there's so many other scary serial killers. So, you know, I know, whatever. They're all the same. Anyway, go check out John Douglas's book on on the on BTK. And, you know, Mindhunter enthusiasts or people who like Mindhunter, reading the book, I mean, I totally just fell in love with John Douglas. I'm sure that everybody falls in love with John Douglas, but I can tell by reading it that it was his life's work to help catch this murderer, this, you know, BTK. And in order to write the book, Douglas had access to Dennis's personal journals, his drawings, the Polaroid snapshots, and written accounts of his crimes. Anyway, I, I think I highly recommend the book. Now, I'm going to take a break from serial killers because this case, I start, what is it, episodes 21 through 23. The, the case really drained the life out of me. There are a ton of resources on this case on my website. And so links to videos of his court hearings and the victim impact statements, recordings of in-court testimony, you can go check those out. They're on my website. You can check them out right now. All right, True Crime Army, let's keep the conversation going. What do you think? What was the scariest thing about BTK? What are some other scary serial killers who are also veterans that you know? Let's, let's, let me know. Let's talk about it. You can follow me on social, on Instagram at Military Murder Podcast, on Facebook at Military True Crime, and on Twitter at Military Murder. Before I leave today, I need to acknowledge a few of my faithful listeners who left a review. First is Crystal Lynn on Facebook, and she's also one of today's producers. She said, quote, anyone who digs true crime must check out this podcast. Not only is Marco an awesome storyteller that hooks you from the get, but her carefully curated episodes are well-researched and incredibly entertaining. They make my runs and workouts feel as though they pass crazy fast, which is already a benefit. Keep up the awesome content, girl. I hope this podcast grows and grows, end quote. Crystal Lynn, you are too kind. Thank you for this awesome review. And yes, you're not the first one that's told me that this podcast gets them through their grueling workouts. 
True Crime Army, if you haven't already tried listening to podcasts while you work out, you're really missing out. At this point, it's the only thing that I do now. I don't even know what the new hip music is because all I listen to is podcasts. So I can tell you all about the top trending podcast, but I can't tell you anything about the new musicians that are out there. All right, so let's uh, see. David on Facebook wrote, quote, this podcast is phenomenal. I wish I had found this earlier. Outstanding job, end quote. Thank you, David. And don't worry, you found the podcast just in time. I'm not going anywhere. At least I hope not. (laughs) Now, one more. Jeremiah wrote, quote, one of the best podcasts because Margot is invested. That comes through in her delivery, end quote. Oh, thank you, Jeremiah. I really appreciate it. I really do work really hard to put these episodes together for you. And, you know, besides this podcast, I also have a full-time job and I have, um, I have a husband and I also have two beautiful children. And so, yeah, I do this because I love it and I want to make sure that I'm putting in some quality work for you guys. All right. Thank you everyone who left a review from the start of my journey until now. I really appreciate it. If you listen to this podcast and you want to leave a review, go ahead You can do that on Apple Podcasts. That's like the biggest place to do it is Apple Podcasts. So if you if you listen somewhere else, but you have Apple Podcasts, go ahead and leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And you can also do it on Facebook. I really the Facebook ones I really appreciate as well. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions, produced by my lovely listeners, Amanda and also Crystal Lynn. And Crystal Lynn makes those fabulous crocheted F-bombs and other fancy things. And all the music was created by TIOPS. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of. And this case displayed that more than any other case so far. So remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. (laughs) Shh, let's work another podcast.